Hi everyone. Welcome to this live. I haven't done a live in a while, but I'm gonna do one with Daniel Mate. So let me just wait for him to hop on and join. And we will begin. Let's see where he is. Hi everyone. Yeah, welcome. Um, hi from Beirut. Let us know where you're calling from. Hi, Daniel. Yes, hi, Hadar. You made it. How are you? Hello, I already got an invite from someone who looks like a Zionist troll who has an Israeli flag to join our live, so. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Why don't they hang out for a bit, hear what we have to say about them? Let us diagnose their issue. Just give us a chance before we work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. It is curable. It is curable, but you have to get the theory down first. Totally. Yeah, it is. Um, well, welcome. Oh, I love this. People are saying where they're from. We got Beirut. We got Cairo. We got Morocco. The first cities were all in the Arab world. So look at that. Edmund, um, Edmonton, Canada. Pop quiz, Hadar. What? province is edmonton in um, i don't know <laughs> like most americans you don't know i know i'm not i'm not learning it on my canadian geography alberta Wicked germany um yeah wicked Wick germany the new, seriously the new bad germany bad bad germany exactly tehran italia cool look at all these places global consciousness is rising i love that um, did i see janine janine Oh, hello. Hi, Diana. So fun. So many people. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'm up. What's it Diana, been? Diana has nothing to say to me, apparently. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to this live. I mean, we recently recorded a podcast together. Not sure if folks had a chance to listen to it, but we wanted to do this live both because, you know, in the podcast, I feel like we were really getting down into a really, um, deep conversation around Zionism and Jewishness and trauma and Palestine and what's been going on with the ongoing genocide and how can we do our part um, to end this viciousness. And we're also offering a couple of things coming up yeah. um, for folks who want to connect with us more personally. Um, yeah, we're going to hold because, you know, I think that part for me, I feel like I've just been feeling the importance of community, you know, the Instagram world, it's beautiful, the connections, the solidarity, the posts, all of it. But there's something that is different when we are in community together and when we're, you know, in the container. So we decided to offer a few containers. Um, one just going to be, you know, a chance for us to get to know you, a chance for you to get to know us. So it's going to be a Q&A on Thursday and all are welcome and half of the proceeds are going to go to Gaza. And then we're going to do two containers. Um, one is going to be specifically for Jewish people who want to um, envision a new world outside of Zionism and what it means to be Jewish and to process. Um, and then the other is going to be open to all around um, how we orient in this disorienting moment. Um, so those two are longer ones, right? They'll last a month each. You want to say anything else about any of that? Uh, only that, you know, we may, we may be able to casually get to some questions here today. I know you had a question box in your story about it. Maybe people have written you some things. But the one on Thursday is going to be a more formal opportunity to actually, you know, Instagram Live is a fairly casual hand and held kind of Q&A experience. The one on Thursday, we'll, we'll be able to get more substantive and uh, I think delve a little deeper. Um, this is hanging out and, and talking about some stuff here today, but uh, you can find out about those offerings at, uh, let me see if I remember the website, malchut, which is M-A-L-C-H-U-T dot one, O-N-E, slash offerings. Yes. Okay. Well, let's get started mm -hmm. with our live. Yeah. I guess, well, I mean, this will kind of just be open-ended, but I wanted to start by just naming something because I just saw a post um, by um, 
this guy Yuval Abraham, who just won an award with Basel Adra in Germany in the Biennial for their their film about um, yeah, just the ongoing displacement, ethnic cleansing, and violence that the community of Masafariata is um, undergoing. And Yuval has been, you know, an activist supporting the community for a long time. And I just read his post, and it was so intense, um, you know, because they gave this speech together about basically a call to end apartheid and um, a call for a ceasefire. And they got attacked, you know, of course, for being anti-Semitic. And Yuval started receiving, like his family received death threats. Um, and he had to actually cancel his trip back home to Jerusalem because um, it got like so intense. And he just wrote a post about this that, um, yeah, just like the mystery use of this word anti-Semitism and specifically right in the German context like I love that someone here um, talked about wicked Germany because it really feels that way right it's like this this guilt about what the Nazis did to the Jews is now um, it's so deep and it's used to just like silence anyone speaking up for Palestine and for Palestinians and just like how misguided that is um, yeah it's like, like the missed opportunity of you would think the lesson of World War II and the Nazi era for Germany would be, let's not be like that ever again. To any like, and let's not let's not blindly enforce a kind of one party line. Let's not venerate one group over another. I think there was some German politician or someone who like gave lip service praise to the filmmakers or congratulated them, but only mentioned Yuval, didn't mention uh, Basel. Yeah. You know, and, and it's just like, no, they're like, I think what we shall do is continue to be this way, but change the cast of characters. We will now, the Jews are our friends. It's just this mindset that hasn't evolved. And totally. that, that's what happens with guilt. Yeah. Guilt that's un, I mean, maybe we can talk about this this is not this wasn't on our agenda but like what's the difference between healthy remorse which allows you to become a better human or a better country and the kind of guilt that keeps you locked in the past mm -hmm. what is the difference were you asking me i'm asking you to take a take a stab at it if you if you want to try what's the difference i mean to me it's just like right the experience of processing it i mean and I, that's why i actually am excited for this conversation right because you're also kind of coming from this perspective of a understanding our own psychology and our own internal you know ways of relating to things and you know we're not like this is I, there's so much i want to say about this but this is why i'm actually excited about our offerings that we're creating because you know i come from a more spiritual perspective and for me one of the core spiritual fundamentals is that um what's happening on the inside actually affects what's happening on the outside inside i mean inside internal world our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, all of it, right? Um, it's not irrelevant to the political reality, to um, the external reality. And when we actually work things on the inside, we can transform them on the outside as well. And yeah. I think that, you know, this is kind of the lens of right of trauma, um, but I don't even want to call it trauma because as you just were talking about, right, all this guilt and all these different things, it's like <laughs> when we don't fully process something, um, it gets replicated. Yeah. You know, and, and the actors are different, I think we're seeing. And one, one actually question that I um, received from the question box was someone who was just like, how can people not see the similarities between the Holocaust and what's going on right now in Gaza? Like, right. And, and, and to me, so much of what the moment that we're living in is in some ways like a whiplash to like the 1930s and 1940s. And, and it does feel like a replication of a lot of systems, of a lot of ideologies, of a lot of, um, yeah, like of, of violence, but the actors are different. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, someone, I love this quote, Germany should go to therapy for guilt instead of taking it out on Palestinians. But anyways, Seriously. tell me what you were gonna say about guilt and remorse and all of it. Well, now there's so much because you put other things on the table, but I trust we'll come around to them all. Um, yeah, that was also interesting. Thank you. Um, guilt is certainly a, 
in the sense we're using the word to distinguish it from healthier Mars. It's a kind of frozen, I think of it as a, like an inner enforcement mechanism and it's very rigid. Sometimes with my mental chiropractic clients, even with Palestinian ones, which I take a risk when I say this, but they seem to enjoy it. I say, that's your inner occupation force, you know. Now in, in the developmental model that my dad and I wrote about in The Myth of Normal, a child has two basic needs to attach with the emotional and physical caregiver and to be themselves. So attachment versus authenticity. In the world we're living in where parenting is compromised and there's tons of stress and intergenerational trauma, it's often going to be the case that the child perceives accurately that they need to choose between attachment and authenticity because their parent can't handle all of them. There's parts that the parent can't be with, their vulnerability, their anger, their joy, their eroticism, whatever it is. Well, then, then the child is always going to choose to compromise their that aspect of their true self rather than compromising. Oh, you know, a three-year-old can't say, well, I'll live without the love as long as I get to be myself. No, you can't say it. So then, but then the question is, how are you going to enforce that? Because it takes a lot of energy to remember, I'm not supposed to be this way. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Better to have an inner enforcement mechanism, just like it's easier for Israel to have the Palestinian Authority controlling the West Bank, doing the dirty work for them. Guilt comes along the minute you even think about asserting uh, who you really are, the guilt comes in. So that's on the individual yeah. level. When it comes, and, and it comes with a certain story. Remorse doesn't have a story to it. Remorse just says, it's a recognition, oh, I did something that's not aligned with who I really am. So authenticity actually is the, is the reference point for remorse. Otherwise, why would you feel remorse? I violated my values. I acted out of integrity. I feel the remorse. I feel that gap, that, that misalignment. I feel that. I feel the regret. I acknowledge the impact on myself and on others. And then I ask, is there anything I can do to redress it, to repair? There may not be. It may be too late for certain things, and you have to grieve that. But you don't make up a story now that I'm bad, and I have to, like, change my fundamental orientation to the words of the world. Rather, it would be redoubling your commitment, mm -hmm. your values. In the case of guilt, it becomes a new, rigid, we can't let that happen again, and therefore screw this principle and that principle. And it, it's out of fear too. The fear of being called anti-Semitic, the fear of of being associated with what the Nazis did, as opposed to just owning that's what happened in our country. So that's, how, that's what I see as a difference. Share a little bit about how you see that in the context, just to translate it into the political frame around what's happening with Germany and Palestine. Like, yeah, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, well, so, I mean, I don't exactly know how it happened, and I haven't read, um, you're probably going to laugh when I say this, but I'm going to mention Norman Finkelstein here. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're always teasing me that I bring him up too much. But he wrote a book called The Holocaust Industry, right. you know, which, and he describes it as kind of a shakedown racket of, of European countries by an industry built around bilking Europe for its guilt as a way of funding Israel and, and, and immunizing Israel from legitimate criticism. Yeah. So I don't know the history and I haven't read that book, but as with, all, as with a lot of books, I take the liberty of quoting them all the time without ever having read them. Okay. And the, the idea is, yeah, but that Germany somehow got, I mean, I think, obviously, it was traumatizing for that country to realize what they had done, and to be seen by the world as the villains. I mean, for decades, German was a joke after the Holocaust, at most, at best. And at worst, it was a synonym for kind of villain in Hollywood, all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Well, now, it, here's Israel is their chance to expiate their sins. It's the Hail Mary they get to say it's the rosary they get to say we support israel we support israel their original sin and, and they haven't and the th thing is it, it it has the illusion of owning a sin but as long as you're hanging on to the guilt you're not really owning it 
your right. And I th I think it's yeah. interesting because I mean even if you read like writings by Hannah Arendt, like you know she really could see all of it this evolving in the way that it did. And as you did say, you know, if, if Zionism were to continue the way that it did, and, you know, like, it's like the only possible solution is that Israel will turn into a full on totalitarian regime. And I read said that. Yeah. Wow. I know reading the reading is helpful sometimes, <laughs> you know, doing the homework is underrated. Yeah, I mean, this is oh, we can get into the whole dynamic, right, about just like how predictable all of what we're seeing is. I mean, even with the genocide happening in Gaza, I mean, I remember I had a Palestinian friend. This is like two years ago, I think. Um, we we're having just a conversation and he said to me, he's like, you know, I think it's gonna, what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be something that's just like so clearly genocidal that that's what's gonna cause whether it's Israelis or Jews or the world to wake up and say like, actually no more. And I remember saying to him like, no, we can't let it get to, you know, like a full on genocidal campaign like it's going on right now. Um, but it's just so weird sometimes to reflect on that conversation and then just like be in this moment, um, you know, because I think for a lot of people, um, you know, who had an awakening on October 7th, who maybe like shifted perspectives or all of a sudden were like, wait, I saw something else and now I'm seeing, right? Like there was some sort of burst for, um, for people and I would say all over the globe. Um, but I think there's just sort of some things so um, heartbreaking and awful, right? That it has to take this level of um insanity yeah. to wake people up and then like even once it's like okay like you know the globe is awakened like i do feel that right there's protests all over there's actions all over there's people speaking talking it's and it's beautiful and somehow it's also like we still can't hold israel accountable for its war crimes well, so you know what your friend got wrong yeah not, not that it was going to happen you got that absolutely right what he got wrong was that it was going to wake everybody up. Well, in fact, totally in, in, in fact, it's woken some people up in the other direction. Yeah. So there was this video of this Israeli actress being interviewed uh, on Israeli television. And she describes herself as like a left wing Israeli, like just a typical liberal secular Tel Aviv Ashkenazi Israeli, as far as I can tell, of the kind that always voted for the Labour Party and probably wanted a two-state solution and were happy about Oslo and were horrified by Baruch Goldstein and, and, uh, and the guy who killed Rabin and all that. And this woman with a tw twisted look on her face says, October 7th woke something up in me. Actually, she says, October 7th murdered something in me. It murdered the humanitarian part. It's dead. I want them all gone. And she proceeds to call Palestinians vermin and stinky and talks about how they wear flip-flops. Like just this, this, this thing right out of Der Sturmer, this hateful. And she says, I used to care. I don't care anymore. I'm still a leftist in a lot of ways, but not in this way. And I was watching someone confess to a kind of mental break a kind of psychosis yeah now i have to think that if her government and her media hadn't exploited that it's like it didn't happen on that day it happened as that day got exploited so just like healthy remorse if it's not processed turns into guilt healthy anger healthy disgust healthy grief if it's not processed calcifies into hatred bitterness callousness and that's what happened with her so there are a lot of zionists who are who would rather die than give up their zionist identity because it forms their entire worldview which right. takes us back to the whole addiction question yeah which we can talk about next okay. they would rather die than that which means they're going to double down on it in the face of a situation like this and that's what they've done hmm. yeah yeah, and I want to actually talk a little bit about that, right? Because we can bring in the psychological perspective into the political one, um, you know, about that thing of just like, how has this not woken up the people, you know? Like, how how, how is it that certain people are actually like, 
holding on even firmer onto Zionism, witnessing, um, you know, witnessing children just being blown up with limbs. Like, you know, how can someone consciously be like looking at that and still supporting the ideology of that? Um, do you think yeah. they're all, do you think they're all, they're all looking, or some people are choosing not to look? I mean, I don't know. I, I can't comment on everybody, but I mean, the pictures are everywhere. You know yeah. what I mean? And I think, yeah. I think to not see them at this point is kind of like. I think they do see them, but I think this is part of the horror of like evil that Arendt was kind of talking about, right? Is that when you are so numb and shut off on the inside, you can see as many horrifying pictures and that still doesn't change your ideology. And I think this is kind of, you know, what I want to talk about is just the ways that that level of rigid ideology manifests. Yeah. And how we break it down, you know, how we break through it is the possibilities of breaking through, right? Some people say like, hey, there's no possible way to break through, you know, people who are still holding on to Zionist ideology, the best thing we can do is just organize external pressure as much as we can, um, right, to, to, to pressure, which is good and important. Um, but I think, you know, me and you are both Jewish, we're in Jewish community, we're you know, celebrate some various <laughs> Jewish traditions, depending on our customs and stuff. But, you know, so we're still kind of embedded in the Jewish world. So th- we also have this level of like responsibility of being um, with, with like redefining and re-understanding how to be Jewish um, and, and what, what Judaism means and, and how to work with Jewish people, right? Because the over like, the overall majority of Jews did adopt Zionism, right? Now it's like we're seeing people rejecting it all over the world. And actually, you know, it was just recently in London and um, there was a protest of Jews for Palestine. And one of the speakers said that a third of British Jews are now anti-Zionist or non-Zionist, which I was like, wow, that's actually a non-insignificant number, well, that's, you know? Very significant. That's major. Uh, I mean, that's enough to form an official opposition party and do some real... I just wanted to read something someone wrote in the in the chat, and this is someone who I've had in my DM, not DMs necessarily, a few, but also comments on lives for a number of months. And when they first showed up, I'm like, "What are you doing here?" Because you're clearly a Zionist, but they've stuck around and they're really engaging. And this is Schwartz Bell, and she says, um, "I'm looking, like as in she's looking at the pictures, and I still struggle to let go of my belief in Israel." Well, that's quite an admission. Mm-hmm. That's quite a vulnerable, candid, honest admission. And I just want to acknowledge you for that, uh, Bell, because that's the truth for so many people. It's like you see the pictures, something in you knows it's horrible. Clearly, you wouldn't be following me or watching my stuff if you were completely closed off to the possibility that you're entirely wrong about Israel. But you can't quite get there. So then the question is, what's going on there? And I rather than condemn you like there's some people who would have no patience for a zionist in their comments and i would sympathize with them any palestinian right now i wouldn't suggest that they have to spend an ounce of energy trying to explain anything to someone who can't let go of israel right but like you just said hadar you and i are in a position where we grew up around zionism you grew up literally in zion you know jerusalem and I went to a Zionist summer camp and was Seth Rogen's camp counselor. And I, I'm one of the people who fed him lies about Israel that he then did an interview about. You know? Although I was one of the did better you ones. Atone on Yom Kippur. What's that? <laughs> did you atone on Yom Kippur? No, that fucker needs to atone to me. He lied about me in his book. He said I cried while playing Indoor Girls at the, at the summer camp campfire. I never cried. I did play Indoor Girls, but I never wept. Called me Counselor Dan. <laughs> slander and lies um but you're right here we are and you and i have some bandwidth and and you can take it as an obligation a responsibility an opportunity whatever i i think we both do feel a responsibility i was interviewed recently by a couple of young israelis who have recently woken up out of their zionism they have a new podcast called yalla this is alon and elik of the one state solution youtube channel and they were asking me about this, and I was kind of training them in my version of jujitsu, J-E-W jitsu, um, of like how to deal with Jew- Jewish attachment to Israel. And one of the things I said, and I'll say it here, is one of them had said, people don't give something up 
if they have something material to lose, right. you know? And I said, it's not just material. It's also immaterial as an identity. And we have to understand that identity is a very powerful thing. Now, identity can be a very positive thing, depending on how we hold it, depending on how we understand it. If, an, if identity is something I can consciously claim to make meaning of my place in the world, to belong to a community, to orient myself, then I can have multiple identities. You have multiple identities, you know? Yeah. I would maybe slightly reframe it because I don't think it's necessarily identity or material or any of that, but I think it's actually the attachments we have to it, right? The, atta yes. have to the attachment we have to material, right? And, and the rigidity that forms when we're attached, you know? And, and for me, so much of that spiritual work, this is part of my personal journey. Why, for it, like, you know, I was fairly young when I deconditioned from Zionism is because I um, was already in this practice of like letting go of my attachments, understanding that whatever I think is true through my mind is kind of an illusion, you know, based on my own psych conditioning and psychology. And, you know, I think every human has to actually go through that process eventually because um, we're all conditioned into certain levels of lies and I don't even want to say, I mean, some of it are blatant lies, right? Forms of racism, discrimination, sexism, all of it. Um, others of it are just um, these certain assumptions or expectations of what is true about the world. Yeah. Um, and if it's not sufficiently challenged, we'll just like hold on to it and, and the attachment will strengthen and then that will not, you know, then we'll just think the world is like that, even though the world might not be at all. So I think that this is where the, like, the psychology spiritual work is, 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 you know, what I have found is that people who are more spiritually developed have an easier time letting go, even if they were very ingrained in that in ideology, right? Because they have some, they have done some work to let go of like the mental constraints and all these different things. And I think, you know, one thing that came about in the podcast when we were chatting, um, you know, two years ago, I wrote this piece on uh, militarization and addiction, actually inspired by your dad's work, because I was learning more about addiction and what is addiction, right? And like addiction is this, this process where you have an unmet need and you desire to meet it, right, on a basic level. Um, and part of what creates an addiction is that the mind, has this certain orientation that it thinks the need will be solved by going to a particular thing. Yes. But it's not. It's actually fundamentally that thing that the mind thinks can go to fundamentally cannot meet that need. But the mental conception is still there. So the addiction kind of loops on itself and it grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And the need is still so unmet. That's right. Addiction has started creating this certain level of like, well, why can't I get it from here? Just one more drink, just more of it, you know, because it, it loops and it feeds. Well, because and and it, it wouldn't feed, it wouldn't loop if it didn't give you a, a, a facsimile of the thing. So you get a hit of it. So what is a person looking for with heroin? Pain relief. It does relieve pain temporarily, but it can't relieve it all the way and it can't relieve the fundamental discomfort of being alive. So then you need more. What is, what is cocaine relieving? Boredom, alienation, so on and so forth, right? Well, what is Zionism relieving? Fear, loneliness, lack of belonging, uh, uh, you know, a, a longing for home, bitterness and anger about how could God, how could God betray us? And, you know, we're on our own. And it, so it gives, with, say it. Someone said safety, safety also. Right? A sense of safety. I, I wrote a song about Zionism, about the waking up out of Zionism or the refusal to back in 1997, that summer that I was a summer camp counselor there. And there was a line, they've brought you in from the cold, built you up with dreams of refuge, made you feel strong and blended, branded their slogans into your skin. And, and it's like that. And so now you associate in people's minds and hearts and nervous systems, your experiences of safety are with this. And this is what birthright's great for, because you catch them while their nervous systems are still forming. You associate it with sex and longing of that kind. Yeah. And of course, Israel's a sexy place with sexy soldiers and everyone's tanned and it's not, doesn't have this usual Jewish awkwardness around sex. 
and you pair that up with going to the, the death camps, right? So you rev up their sense of no safety. They tell you this could happen anytime. You take them to Israel, problem, solution. And the thing about addiction, my favorite quote about addiction comes from my dad's book, Hungry Ghosts. Dr. Vincent Felitti says, it's hard to get enough of something that almost works. Right, totally. Yeah, I love that line. I think it's super powerful. And I think, you know, that is exactly what you were saying about the addiction, right? Like you are actually getting your need met temporarily, but there's just an illusion that you're getting it met because you're getting it met in that moment. Yeah. But then the relapse is actually going to get worse the next time around, right? Like the next time you're going to have that need, it's actually going to be deeper wound because it didn't succeed. And and I think this, this and you know, we really need to write something about this, right? As Zionism as a form of addiction, because I think for me over the years of just like examining people who are really holding on strongly onto this ideology, like I can really see that it's an addiction, like the 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 need for belonging, for safety, for all of that oh, is yeah. so, so deep. Oh yeah. And it's coupled with a mental inconsistency around how to get that. And it's attached to that. Yep. And it just strengthens. And, 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 you know, I think it's so intense because, you know, October 7th, it's like, like, yeah, of course, and no one could have seen that coming in that exact way, but it was a surprise. Except the Israeli security officers who knew about it for a year. Sure. But anyway. Right. But, but I'm saying just like, you know, there was such a pressure cooker and like Palestinian resistance was, of course, going to uprise and going to continue to uprise, I mean, especially with Saudi Israel normalization, right? Like the Palestine issue is just never going away. It's just not just in the, you know, and we've kind of talked about this too. It's just like the same way, right? That narrative with Jewish people that we hold a lot, you know, in so many of our holidays of like, they tried to kill us, they couldn't like the resilience that comes from, from Jewish survival, right? It's the same thing I think with Palestinians. It's like, no matter how militarized or how vicious the system gets right it's not going to actually be successful like palestinian resistance palestinian activism is like always going to be there until the demands are met basically so i think like in the israeli psyche there's something really um obscure about not recognizing that that's the dynamic right because because it's like the attachment to zionism grows and grows and grows and then it's like the backlash becomes stronger and stronger and, and they can't like piece it together that they're related. You, you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I mean, there's a number of factors there. Number one, um, the Palestinians, look, Israel was founded on pretending that you can kick another people off their land and things will be fine. That was the pretense. Whether the pretense took the form of right-wing Zionism, which is to say, we will succeed in wiping out these people, not only these people, but their memory, their living memory of their place. You know, I mean, in all of our Jewish holidays, they, no, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, what were you or, or, say? Well, <laughs> you know, we, we've, been, we've been kicked all over the world. We've been persecuted, right? The Palestinians are being persecuted on their land or on the outskirts of their land. They're right there. They can see it. They can smell it. Like, it's right on the other side of the wall. How much more are they not going to forget? And of course, all of their songs are about the land and all of their weaving is about the land. And I mean, there's no people with a more land-based culture uh, living today that's still alive as a culture. I mean, I guess obviously indigenous peoples everywhere, but it, it's certainly right up there. Um, but I was going somewhere with that. Oh yeah. So whether it's the right wing genocidal and I I've always said I respect this more than the left wing alternative because at least it's honest. We want this, this land. They have it. We're going to use force and whatever means we need terrorism colluding with big imperial powers to kick them off. They're not going to like it. They're going to fight back. We respect them enough to understand that and we will destroy them and kick them out of their land and it'll be ours and eventually will expand enough and they'll die off. Okay, that's one kind of plan. Then there's the left wing version, which pretends that somehow we can do that and we then make friends with them without ever redressing, without ever, we can have justice without reconciliation, you know, truth without reconciliation. But 
Either way, the existence of the Palestinians is an irritant. It's an itch. Which is why you start getting metaphors like vermin and cockroaches and whatever, because to the Israeli psyche, the existence of Palestinians is that mouse you can't catch, that cockroach you can't smash. It's not the Palestinians. It's the memory of what we did. Mm. The reminder that this is built on sand, so to speak, that 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 this is built on a lie, on an illusion. And until they go away, we can't rest. We can't have Sheket, peace yeah. and quiet. So now we're addicted to the, to the, since we can't get rid of them, we're addicted to anything we do that makes us feel like we're finally going to do it. And right. it's finally going to be over. And I think that's the one addiction in the Israeli psyche. And anytime we do something that says we don't fundamentally care, that addiction of the rush of, of dopamine and false strength that you get from just not caring, from having no vulnerability whatsoever, like this actress was expressing, yeah. you get the hit of that. And you can never get enough of it because it's it never gives you the security you want. You know, bitachon is the biggest the biggest word used in Israeli politics. Security, security, security. It's the most insecure country in the world. Mm -hmm. And right. and it the, the the question becomes when will it hit rock bottom? That's a scary question. What would it look like for that country to hit bottom at this point? But then but individuals can hit bottom and more and more individuals are. Right. And you know, like scholars of totalitarian states basically say that the way that a totalitarian state crumbles is the only way is through introducing chaos, basically, right? Because the order is so order, right? It's so rigid, the ideology is so firm. So you actually need a level of chaos to stir it up. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I mean, it's basically chaos and self-destruction. You well, know, This is why my, my favorite protest that I've seen in Israel so far wasn't the stand standing together, pro nothing wrong again with standing together, but it wasn't a bunch of people chanting slogans like free Palestine or end the occupation or anything like that. It was a bunch of hostages families bursting into a Knesset meeting. Yeah. And not chanting anything in unison. Every single one of us, one of them was screaming their own customized monologue. <laughs> it was the most yeah. Israeli thing I've seen. Yeah. Israelis don't chant slogans. They dance around and sing, you know. But what they also do is they just fucking yell. And these people were just yelling from the, from the depths of their guts, calling them liars, murderers, cowards. You're and it went on for like four minutes. And these Knesset members are just sitting there around the table. What do we do? And if, you know, if I'm sitting here and there's a person here, I'm going to hear their voice loudest and the next person over there a little softer. But if this person's sitting over there, they're going to hear this total, it was like performance art. Yeah. And, well, and it, it was brilliant. And that was the chaos that I loved to see because the unanimity in Israeli society in a totalitarian society was breaking down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, two things. I mean, I think the way that so much of Israeli society is just structured around everything being normal there of like, oh, there's no problem. It's all fine. Right. Like just how um, insane that is already, you know, um, but also it's just, yeah, I mean, hearing you say that, like, I can't like my heart hurts, you know, because I think that part of this whole, whole Zionist project was also in some ways to set up the Jews, right? I mean, it was so convenient for Europe, nation states, for colonialism to be like, great, let's get the Jews to do this. And then the Arabs will hate the Jews. And then, you know, we'll still get our military and oil and, you know, capital and imperialism and all of that. And I think that, you know, one of the kind of myths that's also breaking down is that Israel was created and continues to exist to protect Jewish people and how um, how that's just not true, right? I mean, not Jews across the world, but not even Jews who are Israelis and how painful that is because so many Israeli Jews were deluded into thinking that Israel is, you know, and, and obviously I can speak about this from Mizrahi perspective as well. And that's part of what happened, right? It is that Mizrahi was, were sold Zionism as a religious project actually, right? That's the only reason why it worked is that Oh, Jerusalem, you've been praying for Jerusalem, like come to Jerusalem, all of this. And then when they got there, it's like, you know, treated like shit. So, um, 
Yeah. And, you know, someone here said something about fantasy and projection, which I think we should talk a little bit about because it's also something that I feel, especially now being in the U.S., it's like so fascinating in the Jewish community, not just in the Jewish community, but I'll just speak particularly into it. But like there's just so much fantasy about what Israel is mm -hmm. as opposed to a reckoning with the reality of it right it's like it's like well this is what i feel it is or this is what the image i have like israel is a, israel is a whole mood it's a fantasy yeah. it's a fantasy that is like you know biblical stories feed off of it the governmental politicians know how to you know but but it's just and, I, and i'm constantly honestly shocked since i got to the u.s just like the level of rhetoric in the u.s where people talk about israel and have such little understanding of what is actually it's like on the land you know there's such a huge disconnect between the fantasy that israel and zionism holds in people's minds versus the reality of it so so we're seeing that right part of like deconstructing the ideology is also understanding like okay well what is this mental attachment there right i mean when i was using the word identity i was using it in the strict the original death definition of it, or the etymology of it at least, comes from the Latin, uh, it's two words, uh, facere, which is to make, and idem, which is the same. When you make one thing the same as the other, now, so if I am, if Israel is me, now I'm completely identified with it, I'm welded to it. It's not just that I carry my identity loosely, and it includes being from that land, or being Jewish, or anything like that. But now I am that. So if you tack it, you tack me. It's like when Dr. Fauci said, if you question me, you're questioning science, which a lot yeah. of people rightly got pissed off about. Um, and Israel has done that with Jewishness fraudulently and without our consent. And as far as the Mizrahim and, and, and other people who have a hard time waking up to what Israel's even done to them, well, who's going to go to bat the hardest to defend the alcoholic father? Their mm -hmm. kids. Right. Until, right. To, you know, that's, you know, that's why there's a group called Al-Anon, you know, adult children of alcoholics to deal with what it does to your psyche to grow up underneath that. Because you can't, again, it's attachment versus authenticity, actually, yeah. on the national scale. People are, they don't know who they would be without that identity. Mm -hmm. And they, They've been sold a bill of goods that the world will swallow them up and hate them. So you better let us take care of you. And if we're imperfect, we're imperfect. You can go out and protest corruption or whatever in the Supreme Court. But right. don't, don't you dare abandon the core bunkered view that it's us against the world, that they hate you because you're Jewish, and only we can protect you. Right. I don't know what it takes to break that up but people have to there has to be a glitch in the matrix the matrix is such a great metaphor for everything how does neo wake up he starts to notice little well what was that little glitches yeah yeah and i think we have to exploit those glitches because they exist and we have to kind of find them and point them out and question people like how do you explain what this cabinet officer just said if israel is the most moral army in the world what are these tick why are israeli soldiers feeling like like they can in huge numbers and without consequence without reprimand post tiktok videos of them posing with palestinian women's lingerie what yeah. is that what kind of army does that yeah you know that's a glitch in the matrix yeah yeah it's like absolutely horrifying right and there's like there's no there's no end there right there's no there's no accountability for like because there's no limit it's like it can just get more and more psychotic and more like you know until it explodes someone just said nur just said we are not the victims we are the victims which is such an interesting cryptic thing to say but it's actually very insightful what was zionism purporting to do it's going to end jewish victimhood what right. is it predicated on jewish victimhood what does it perpetuate jewish victimhood constantly and you know i think um james baldwin has this really brilliant line that has stayed with me since I read it, which is basically like, just because someone treats me like a victim doesn't make me a victim. Right. Which I think is one of the most powerful things you can say, right? Because you can be a victim of a system of oppression or a genocide or all of that, 
but actually still understand who you are and that you are not actually in your own. And I think this is where the psychological work gets really right because victim consciousness is actually so dangerous. It's so dangerous, right? Being a victims of a genocide, which you know, Jews were of the Holocaust, like, okay, obviously not their fault. Like obviously a horrifying thing to happen. Um, and like part of the evolution of what happened there is like, there was an internalization of the victim consciousness that all this, you know, that's just part of why I actually love teaching Jewish mysticism so much because I think someone recently asked me this on a podcast and I went on a whole 20 minute rant about this, but like, I actually love Judaism because I don't actually see, like, of course, you know, in my lineage, like, yeah, there is Jewish pain. That's part of my history. There's no denying that. And like my relationship to Judaism really comes from a place of love because I think that it's a really beautiful tradition that has so many like wise offerings and teachings and rituals and, and all of that. And that's just such a different way to connect to Jewish identity than like we're a victim, we're a victim, we're a victim, we're a victim and kind of playing that on loop. And and to me, my perspective, right, is that victim consciousness, the way that it's kind of gotten a hold on our Jewish community. I mean, to me, it's part of a relationship to God, right? There's a certain level of emptiness of God of like, why would God abandon us? And then like that kind of possession, you could call it a little a bit of a, right? There was a little possession that was there, but it was also right sitting on that wound of, of belonging of like who we are, like, there was like an insane rupture yes. in the Jewish world around like who we are as people. So that rupture, you know, Zionism kind of just took over it and, and did really possess the Jewish people. And now we are kind of in this moment where it's just like, okay, how do we do like an exorcism? <laughs> right? And like remove that. But also part of that is also right. Realigning what our lineages are all about and, and actually mending that rupture. Like, that's why I, I don't think that there's a shortcut here, right? We can't just be like, we're anti-Zionist Jews and we're going to assimilate into the West and then that's it. There, there actually needs to be a very deep reckoning. That's right. Uh, with, with and, you know, and it's intense. It's not, it's not simple. Well, and that's what we're trying to do with the, the March cohort, right? The, the, the yeah. four-week thing we're doing that we mentioned at the beginning and we each have a post on our, our profiles. People can go find out about it. Um, talking about victim consciousness. Yeah, well, this is what I mean about identity. And it's so ironic because there's another principle that applies here, which is what you resist persists. Mm -hmm. So grief, I consider grief the great conveyor belt of life. Yeah. Because it conveys us, it's a moving sidewalk that, that it, much more quickly than we'd be able to do alone, takes us in the face of overwhelming loss and it conveys us from the land of should have been or shouldn't have been. This should not have happened to the land of here we are, it happened. And mm -hmm. here we are. Now, someone who's unwilling to get on the conveyor belt of grief is going to stay stuck in, it shouldn't have been this way, it shouldn't have been this way, it shouldn't have been this way. They're living in a, in a past conditional counterfactual tense that doesn't exist in reality which is the, the tense of what should not have happened. Mm -hmm. They're refusing to grieve. If it shouldn't have happened, it had to be someone's fault. And it'll always end up being on some level our fault. We went like sheep to the slaughter. Right. Very Israeli way of looking at the Holocaust. We weren't strong. We didn't stand up for ourselves. There's something shameful about it, which means we were victims, but we will never again be victims. Mm -hmm. We sh should not be victims. Okay, now we have something to resist about ourselves and our history. Now what you resist persists. You push on it, it pushes back. You refuse mm -hmm. to admit, because to get on that conveyor belt of grief would be to say, you know what? We were victimized. We were the vict yeah. victims of forces way bigger than us and it destroyed, it almost destroyed an entire language. Yiddish, it wiped out an entire culture, it radically transformed our world, and we're never going to be able to go back. That's a big thing to swallow and sigh and, and, and be able to say. Mm. But it's true. And if we can say it, then there's the possibility of letting go of it. But the minute we say we shouldn't be it, now you're identifying with it. Yeah. And now you need to be it. It's this complete inverse of what it would seem. So Zionism, like you said, 
swept into the rescue. I think of it, have you seen Little Shop of Horrors? No. Oh, sorry. I recommend it. Of all movie musicals, it's fantastic. I, I will see it if you read um, The Origin of Totalitarianism by Iran. <laughs> oh, my God. That's an exchange program I'm happy to do. <laughs> Anyway, it's about a blood-sucking plant that that a little nebbish of a flower shop clerk played by Rick Moranis uh, finds, and it's bringing all this business to the to the failing flower shop he works at in, in Skid Row, you know. Uh, but it keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it wants more and more blood. Yeah. And he's running out of blood, like he's getting anemic. And then he realizes he can start killing people and feeding it. And the plant starts singing to him, feed me, feed me, feed me. You know? And it, so it comes along as the solution to a problem. He's a loser who can't get the girl. He's poor. He is the victim of class-based oppression mm -hmm. in, a, in a cruel world. He is. But the plant says, you don't have to be. Great. You don't have to be. So now... He has to keep going on this cycle. And now he is victimized by this plant mm -hmm. that's driving him to do horrible things. You know, it's a perfect analogy for addiction, yeah. for addictive yeah. nationalism, actually. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to say one more thing. Little, Little Shop of Horrors, people, from 1986, directed by Frank Oz, who plays Miss Piggy and Yoda and, Gro and Grover and Bert from The Muppets. Uh, with Rick Moranis and Steve Martin and Bill Murray and John Candy. It's brilliant. Back to you. Yeah, um, I want to say one more thing, um, but maybe actually we can also open it up. Um, if folks have any questions, just as like a trial of like what our Q&A, feel welcome to write some questions. And I love all the engagement. People have been saying some really beautiful, very thoughtful things. So thank you for engaging. Um, Adar, does, does Instagram kick you off your lives at, a, at the hour mark? Like it does me? Okay, well then we don't, if it doesn't, then this is on your channel, so we don't need to rush. Why does it kick you out? Because I'm me, I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm annoying, or I'm dangerous. I don't think it has, but we're gonna find out. It always uh, does, that's why I always do two-parters. Oh, really? Yeah, but other, oh, interesting. Other, other people don't seem to have to. Okay, well, we're gonna find out. Um, well, yeah, I mean, if there's any questions for us that you want us to answer now, um, please no. feel welcome to write in. Um, Oh, if you go at an hour, it can't be saved. Is that what it is? What? Should we try to save it? What, That's what not we... true. Is that, is that true? Is that true? Tell us, people. <laughs> um, I'm going to look it up. Are you seriously going to look it up? Okay, yeah. well, maybe, as you say, that, that. Thing about, um, yeah, please feel welcome to come in with questions. But, you know, we talked about all these different processes of, like, addiction and victimization and, and I really also want to t touch just briefly about fear and how much fear can really control you in, you know, because I'm sure you get these, you know, comments all the time from Jews or past Zionists or any, it's just like, wow, like, it's so brave that you're speaking up against the genocide. It's so brave. It's so brave. And it's like, it's actually not. It's just basic. Right? It's basic to speak up about human rights. Um, and, and I th think that so, there's so much fear around standing up for Palestine and for Palestinian rights, right? Because there's so much repression that's coming in all sorts of countries in all sorts of ways, right? But, um, but just, I think the way that fear keeps us bound into a disempowered state, right? And, 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 and it's like, we keep in life wanting, you know, more belonging, more this, more that, but like, we actually, in order to get all of that, we have to work through the fear, yeah. you know, because otherwise, so, so I think, you know, if anyone's listening to this and is still having a hard time finding your voice or speaking up or is too scared to write a story or, you know, comment on a thing, it's like, I think that, you know, one of the things that I teach a lot is that courage is the muscle of the heart. Mm -hmm. And this is a time where we have to practice courage. Um, well, literally courage, the word comes from the roots, you know, cœur in French, cor in, I think, Italian, corazón. Yeah. Same, same route. Um, can you, should I, I mean, I've got, I, I've got, not, what's that? Should I, should, should I, what, what do you think should we do? Should we end I this? Think we should, I think we should keep going. I don't believe that you can't save it over an hour. But what if this conversation gets lost? It won't. It'll be in our archives. Okay, fine. We'll yeah. And if it does, everything is temporary anyway. 
Um, I do need to use the bathroom. That's not temporary, uh, or that it, I need it to be temporary. Okay. Uh, so can you take I'll, some questions? Yeah, I'll take I'll take the. the but I agree with you about I agree agree with you about bravery. Except there are some people who have material things to lose, jobs, sure. no, of course, status, and that's something to consider. We can't tell. No, anyone and else I don't mean that. Do. You know, everyone finds their own way. I think it's more of just examining the ways that fear can control our voice. Yeah, I'm still listening. I'm I'm, I'm here, but. Yeah, you can go to the bathroom and I'll speak to the people. But um, video limit is four hours. Wow, four hour live. Let's go. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, yeah, the fear just keeps us so bound and and keeps us into me mechanism of control. Like I really, you know, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about in this time is just the ways that control and manipulation are so ubiquitous and how we've just gotten so accustomed to being controlled, you know, or wanting to control others or all these different things. And we don't know how to just exist, right, without this, like, fear, control, this, that, like, and, and I think part of the um, liberation, right, um, that is being called for all of us right now is to also do the psychological work of seeing, like, what is this bringing up for all of us and how can we, right, um, work on this, um, yeah. Well, this is why people. How do you feel when people say this? Palestine, Palestine is freeing all of us. You know, yeah. I some like I like that phrase, and I also hate it because it's kind of like the Palestinians. If I was a Palestinian, I'd be like, "Well, can you get free some other way?" Like, <laughs> you know, like, like it's making them. But but this moment certainly is teaching us something about well, like, what freedom I do, means. I do. Rest with that and that means right because I think part of what we are speaking up against right is of course what's happening in Gaza what's happening in the West Bank what's happening to Palestinians all over um, but it's not just right it's also about this global system of militarization and imperialism yeah. and repression yeah. right like that actually is going to end up affecting all of us whatever our identity is um, because it's also killing our whole planet <laughs> you know so yeah. um, I think right this this is for me why it's so important that Palestine is centered as a human rights issue and not as a religious issue of like, oh, the Jews or the Muslims or the this, right? Because it really is about human rights and it is about colonialism. Especially and since think... Israeli bombs don't know the difference between a Muslim and a Christian Palestinian. Right. Or a Jewish, or a Jewish hostage. Right. And I think that, yeah, like the fight against colonialism, like I think that we've been, um, needing to do a global reckoning with that and it hasn't happened in so many different contexts you know in turtle island and can't like all the places and i think you know the prayer is that this moment is also you know leading us to really reckon with the history and presence of colonialism and like what does that mean to actually dismantle that right. all over i do resonate when palestine is framed in that way because then i'm like yeah, we need to get to work. We got to talk about all these things. We also have to liberate ourselves from the inside, right? This is for me where the spiritual work is so critical because we can't just like scream about liberation and then be caught in these patterns of controlling our own selves, right? It doesn't make sense. Like there's a level of like, we have to embody the liberation we're dreaming of. Um, and that requires a lot of work because we're all psychologically damaged, you know? Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you. I've been saying we scream free, free Palestine, but we have no freedom to give if we don't know it from the inside as an experience. It just becomes a concept. And now we're just opposing. Now we just want something to change, but we don't have a vision of what freedom would mean. I've been even getting a little spicy in my mental chiropractic walks. I've been walking with a lot of Palestinians recently, like explicitly inviting them to, you know, to use the service. And, and like I said, like I, I, I talked about guilt as the inner occupation force. I've been taking the liberty of saying, I said to someone the other day, I said, you know, your guilt will not free Palestine. Right. Your guilt about being a survivor of, or, or living somewhere else. And, and they were like, no, you don't understand. We were raised with this. And I said, no, I get it. And I can't understand because I wasn't raised that way. Although lots of peoples are raised with guilt. But what your, your people need from you is not this, vortex inside of you that always leads you back to how bad you are mm -hmm. it needs and and in fact and then the person kind of said there was kind of an aha moment they're like oh my god 
that's what the Zionists want for us. It's for us to be trapped in this constant spiral of shame and guilt and cut off from ourselves and each other. I'm like, there you go. Don't let them win. Right. And, and it's like a bold thing to say to a Palestinian, but it, it felt important. And it's so much, it's just as true for all of us who aren't carrying that specific lineage of pain and dispossession, but are just witnessing it. Mm -hmm. and, and who might be part of groups that are responsible for it. Yeah. Um, I'm just reading some of the comments. I actually wanted to touch base on this. Someone wrote this, I loved it. But actually, because you made a, a video series about Brene Brown's face, people were just talking about how so many psychologists who are, who are talking, who are like teaching about narcissism or spiritual leaders who are talking about all this liberation are actually kind of silent right now. Or if they're not silent, they're pretty um, awful things that are just, I mean, A, kind of irrelevant, because <laughs> it just kind of shows how little they know. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm curious if you wanted to speak a little bit, I mean, especially coming from who you are and who your family is, right? Like you guys have all been so vocal about Palestine for such a long time and still very, you know, admired in the psychology, spiritual healing world. Like, what is your take about Right, the silence that exists from people who are in that same field, who are like, actually, you know, it's because it, it is quite shocking. Because I come across them too. Ooh, Dan who left. Maybe he needed to get booted off. No, let's see if I can invite him again. Oh, sorry, I, I accidentally swiped the wrong way, and it, re it I, I got kicked off. Okay, I was like, damn. I, uh, <laughs> I reject your question. How dare <laughs> yeah. you ask me that? I was like, what a protest at the end, right at the end, just being like, fuck this conversation. No, um, but, but. You just, guys, I'm going home. <laughs> I just like, yeah, because I come across these people sometimes who are trauma experts, leaders, and somehow just can't say anything okay. right now. So I, I'll, I'll say a few things about that. Yeah, go for it. The floor is yours. Thank you. Although, oh, feel free to come onto the floor. <laughs> No, I'm um, yeah. Well, there's a few dynamics that we could name, I think. My dad did an event with one of my favorite spiritual teachers, Adya Shanti, uh, in California, in the Bay Area, Marin County, I think, Who five, I six Adi years ago. Shanti, by the way, he's great spiritual He's teacher. so great. He's so down to earth, so straightforward. No, you don't have to believe anything. It's just, it's kind of like physics. You just observe the mind. You observe consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. It's not cold but he's not all woo woo you know he's just a, he's a little little mountain bike riding guy with a with a funny name or a, an indian name but he's white um and my dad asked him straight up in this event he said what do you make of the fact that so many spiritual gurus and teachers are found to sexually abuse their followers and i just trying to he said, you know, I've wrestled with that. And he said, I don't have a definitive answer, but I wonder if it's something like this. There's no necessary correlation between spiritual advancement and emotional maturity. Mm -hmm. That you can have all this, you can have, you can have, you can have consciousness skills that allow you to perceive all kinds of grand capital T truths and have a real skill at embodying that in a way that resonates for other people and activates their consciousness or whatever. But you haven't done the work on your own wounds and your own blind spots and the ways that you the th things you're hungry for and the ways you're willing to cut corners to get it and then you just use your status as a means to an end and you've all in the mind will always find a justification for it and so it's a false assumption that someone who has spiritual insight will necessarily be self-aware much less more about it so that's sure. one thing well just just to say quickly on that that's something that Annalisa actually talks a lot my spiritual teacher um talks a lot about as well of like you can advance in your own mind and consciousness and understanding of reality but she phrases it more as a gap is relational yes. right the relational wounding absolutely of like, okay then you get into dynamic family or with friends and all of a sudden you're like what do i do here right so it's different forms of advancement well that's right 
because I mean, and of course, in miracles talks about level confusion, right? You can understand that on a certain level, at the highest level, level seven, maybe, God is all there is. There is no genocide. Everything is God's will. There's no conflict. You know, in fact, it's all an illusion. Okay, that's a valid dimension to be able to access. But if you try to hang out there and then relate to the world, you're, the material world you're living in, as if that's all there is, you're going to do some real evil things. You're going to do, you're going to be a real moral idiot, you know, and, and be a bad person, functionally speaking, with regards to other people. Because at the highest level of consciousness, there's no separation. There's no me. There's no you. So how can I violate you? It's all an illusion. It's all in your head. It's all the story you're making up. You can take any spiritual truism, any spiritual truism mature way of understand right so it's a certain level of immaturity there that's also maturity but i'm saying you can take any standalone spiritual truism and turn it into dogma and misuse it the why, mm -hmm. why that's not wisdom that's i don't know knowledge or something so that's right. one aspect of it the other aspect of it is these people are all spiritual business people they are in the business of selling spirituality they are inextricable from the capitalist system in which they exist and capitalism incentivizes certain things and disincentivizes other things yes. one of the things that incentivizes is not going too much against the prevailing regime and specifically the u.s security state and its global view and just generally the the world view of the system in which you're living right which is a whole like oh we have a budget for wellness retreats within this very sick corporate world I'm sure, you know I'm sure, the, I'm sure the cia has a budget for wellness retreats as does the air force right you know so these people are disincentivized yeah from stepping outside the acceptable mainstream bounds now the media plays and this is where we get to noam chomsky the manufacturing consent our intellectual classes he always said our media classes and these days i would say our spiritual wellness class is part of the propaganda system it bounds the acceptable terms the bounds of debate so you can totally we are in a free society right to quote metallica you can you can do it your own way if it's done just how i say you're you're free to disagree up to here right. and up to here but out here doesn't even exist so you'd never think about it so someone like Brene Brown, why I took such exception to what she did was that she, she was claiming a kind of above it all perspective that isn't taking sides and loves everybody or whatever, and but isn't a fundamentalist. And I accused her of being a fundamentalist for, for a neutral. Well, it's also like, sorry, just to cut off because it angers me also. It's just like her statement was like, oh, like both sides, but then not at all even Palestinians are not even in that side. Like, even if you're like, I'm going to acknowledge both sides, like, there wasn't even an acknowledgement of the Palestinian side. Yeah, there sort of, there sort of was, but a total yeah, misrepresentation. Not, a an total, Nakba, not an acknowledgement of nothing. the, you know, Occupation. like. No, the most, the farthest these people will go is that Netanyahu is a, is a right-wing extremist, right. and we need to stop violence and extremism on both sides. Anytime you hear mm -hmm. talk about, anyone talk about extremism on both sides, you can dismiss them because what they're doing is they're erasing power, right. material power relations from the equation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the in inability to see social class, the inability to see imperialist power structures, and you're trying to neutralize and even everything, mm -hmm. when in reality, that's not how it is. Right. Which means she can think she's acknowledging Palestinian suffering, but I don't know, maybe, maybe the Palestinians on the moon, but not the Palestinians on Earth. Like they she have a they have a suffering she won't see. What's that? She probably does think that in her mind. She's just like, I have so much compassion for Palestinians, what, you know. She, but, said, she said, my only my only religion is seeing the face of God in in everybody, right? Right. 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 That's for me where I get also really just frustrated, um, you know, as an Arab person, right? Because it's just like the ways in which, I mean, the ways that Palestinians are dehumanized is very similar to the way that all, all Arabs are dehumanized, right? All people from the region and like the trauma 
uh, the level of humanness, like it's just never really acknowledged, especially in like Western spiritual spaces. And that's something that I had to also, you know, through being in a lot of them, it's just like, there was no context to even understanding the levels of pain and grief and trauma I'm carrying. And yeah, it's just really frustrating when you see, right, all these trauma healer guru people talking about empathy and compassion and empathy for everyone, and then consistently leave out a whole region and hold the whole people of a region. Well, she gave away the game at the beginning of it with the way she framed it. She said, I am deeply connected to the Jewish community and I stand with them, whatever. I also recognize recognize that Palestinian people are having a kind of hard time right now, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> so she's admitting she's not deeply connected to the Palestinian world. Now, I can have some compassion for that. It's not. I can't support it. But for a long time, even though I support Palestinians, I wasn't really connected to any real ones. They were a sympathetic abstraction to me, even as an ally. Yeah. It's very different. It's a whole world of difference to actually be connected to real Palestinians. It complicates the vic the version of them as perfect victims, which is what Germans have now about Jews, the philo-Semitic view, right. you know, that which is not the same as humanizing people. But here she is in a position of extreme wealth and privilege with all kinds of, of students. Um, and, I, and I just think she's more comfortable with the elite than she is with the people. And the people includes a bigger proportion of people from parts of the world that the U.S. has screwed over. And Arabs are number one in that category. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to rank everybody because there's a lot of people. But... tied for number one. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't have to, you know, get into all who suffers more. But I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that she's more part of the, I mean, maybe that's one frame. I would reframe it more as just like, it because it, she's and i don't want to make it specific about her but for me what i see in there is like a um a lack of commitment to truth to truth as it is you know i guess this is something your dad says all the time but i really appreciate it right where it's just like it's not that you're speaking yeah we're ta we're taking questions you can write questions and i looked at the chat box and figuring it out but um yeah it's like for me it's very much it's like it's not that i'm like i mean of course there's so many palestinians in my life that i love very deeply who are like my family and I see what they're going through and it breaks my heart and then I want to do everything I can to end this madness. And at the same time, it's not just because of that relationship to Palestinians. It's also because that's like what the truth is and that's what the courageous thing is. And I think that, I mean, whatever, we don't have to get so into it around the spiritual community. This is just something that I feel frustrated in with the new age spiritual community is there's such a lack of, understanding what truth is and there's all these like concepts and all these conversations and all and they're just not even touching reality well, you know right because you can hang out in capital t truth but if you're not in small r reality then you're not then your truth isn't grounded in anything it's just floating around you know in space and the fact is these people are benefiting from the same system that is making it happen so they're just not incentivized to speak and i can tell you you know You know, I have a best-selling book under my belt. I never expected to say that, but I do. I co-wrote The Myth of Normal. I had lunch with my agent today, our, my, our book agent. And I said to her, are there any jitters behind the scenes at the book company, you know, about what my dad and I are doing? She said, oh, yeah. Sure. Don't worry about it. I've got your back. Yeah. And no real threats or anything. But the, the closer you, you are to the centers of power and influence, the more nervousness there is around telling truth because that's not what the system is built to do. Even yeah. if you're selling yeah. books, even if you're selling lots of books about the truth. And, you know, I, I know my dad, he's very committed to speaking the truth, but it's, he's in a different position than he ever has been. Right. He has more to lose now, you know? So yeah. it's, it's just how it, it's just how systems work. It's how systems induce good people to be silent. Um, and and uh, why we admire people who don't take that golden carrot that's being offered them. Instead, they opt for truth, principles, integrity, things like that. Right. People keep asking us to have a conversation with Sam Harris. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I call Sam Harris the, the stupid person, the smart person. I mean, I was telling Daniel one time that um, there's three people that trigger the most out of me. Do you remember the three? Sam Harris is all three of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Harris, Sam Harris, and Sam Harris. No, 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 like he, like the types of people. And he's, oh, oh um, yes, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson. No, 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 no. There's three people that trigger me a lot. The first yeah. is people who are oh. atheists and people who right, are, right, right. I don't believe yeah. in God. God, um, you know, like I get triggered by that because I'm a woman of faith and my whole life is about God. The second is a pe people who, you know, usually are similar in the atheist camp who are like hate on religion, but are obsessed with science, but are obsessed with science in a very like frigid fundamental religious way. way. Science is their religion, but they're so like, they're like religion sucks, but we love science. And it's just that. And, and the, the third, third are Islamophobes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, I just got really triggered by this framing that's just like so um, ubiquitous and so ignorant. And, and Sam Harris is all three of those things. So I would be massively triggered in a conversation with him. That guy's a moron. And, he, he, and he's also an example of one of these people who thinks he's so virtuous because he's on the liberal side. He actually said, I don't care if Joe Biden has beheaded baby... <laughs> I think he said the headed baby. This is a year ago, way before October 7th. If he has babies in his freezer in the basement, mm. I'm still voting for him over Donald Trump. Like that level of I don't want to know and I don't care because my worldview says that I'm on the right side. No matter what my side does, it has to be the right side. Yeah. That's a kind of fundamental fundamentalism and he doesn't see it and then he holds himself as superior to people who have a sense of there being more to this universe than just the brilliant mind of sam harris right people are telling us to, <laughs> this is so funny people are like who is sam harris hi deborah Wait, um okay maybe we should start wrapping up here is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to talk about before are you bored are you bored of me already <laughs> yeah <laughs> no it has been an hour and 20 minutes it's I'm true like, yeah yeah no. Yeah, we should we shouldn't go longer than ninety. Yeah. Um, is, is there anything else? Not on my mind. Um, yeah. Do you want to say a word about our offerings? Yes. A, yeah, yeah. Action for the people because actually this was really fun to also engage with people and see people's remarks and um, yeah I think like you know like the community building through this time has been so inspiring for me and different um, people in my life kind of coming together over this. So, yeah. 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 I don't know. I want to say anything about it. Well, we mentioned at the beginning, some people might not have caught it. I would say that, you know, the, the first thing that's open to everybody, like the big net everyone can jump into and be caught safely. <laughs> would be our event on Thursday, right. which is an hour and a half, at least on paper. And um, it's a Zoom call, which will mean that you can actually come on camera if you want and ask us questions. And it's about orienting ourselves in disorienting times, you know. And for people who are feeling lost in any number of ways, Hadar and I offer, I think, I think we're going to find, I mean, this is already the sense we have, I'm pretty sure, but the theory at least is that we each offer our own uniquely developed, obviously derivative and influenced by all kinds of other traditions, but we each have our own kind of patented uh, approach. Yours is... Mine's not patented. Not, but not, <laughs> it's, not, it's not actually patented, no. Uh, <laughs> Only we, only God knows who's is what, you know. Yeah, God is the great copyright lawyer in the sky. Exactly. Um, yours is energetic, spiritual, mixing that with the cultural and political and poetic and artistic. I mean, it's hard to even sum yours up, but you have all these different um, threads to your to the fiber of what you do, right? I guess I do too. I call it mental chiropractic, but you can tell I'm not averse to the spiritual. I just talk about it from a different perspective. So we'll both be each be bringing our own approach and answering people's questions from that place. And we'll see what, what together we can offer people in terms of some orientation. We're not going to fix anything. We're not going to give advice uh, unless some spontaneously comes, but it's more about helping people. What I do with people is helping people get unstuck.
And I think what you do with people is helping them be liberated. And we want to have that in the space. And the more people we have, the bigger the container, the, the more the energy of it will be a, a, a beautiful uh, fabric. So that's on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. in England, 8 p.m. in the land, as you call it. And it's basically uh, pay what you can with half the proceeds going to Gaza. Exactly. And then we've got these two, two months long things you can also read about. If you're Jewish and you want to do an exploration of what Jewishness is going to look like going forward or how we could possibly salvage Jewishness from this crisis. Because we're going to have to create Jewishness as much as remember it, you know. Because mm. um, something's being burned up right now. I don't know what it is, but I, I don't know what's going to be left. But we're going to explore that together. It's going to be a collaboration between us and you. That'll be over the month of March, I think skipping one week for Purim, it's on Sundays. And then we have another Sunday four week cohort in April, which is for everybody, whether you're Jewish or not, yeah. about more orienting in a, in a more, in a deep way. And we'll see however it goes. Maybe we'll also do like in-person retreats and all of that. Um, someone here asked a question that I'll just, um, said, thank you both. I listened to your podcast episode. Can you speak to finding practicing hope in the face of despair, especially when recognizing the very real ways we are powerless? So just to kind of answer that question in relation to our offerings, I think that um, one thing that I think is breaking is the illusion, especially in the spiritual community, that healing is individual, right? And I think this is part of what I've observed, um, you know, this level of horror. Uh, which the podcast is on my podcast. It's on Hadar's web. So you're welcome to find it on Spotify and Apple and all those things. Um, There's lots but of links to it or, or at least clips from it on our profiles. The levels of horror that we are collectively witnessing right now um, is not normal. It's not humane. And it's too much for one single body to process. Yeah. It's actually too much for one single body to process. And if we're isolated and we're trying to reckon with this, it's gonna blow up our nervous system and we're not gonna be well, right? And the only way that we can, you know, in some ways, right, we were talking in the beginning of the importance of like meeting things as they are about speaking the truth about, you know, is through community, is through other people. Because what happens when we are with other people, we kind of create what is called a collective field or a collective nervous system. And then all of a sudden you have more support. Um, so I think that it's just so important. I mean, whether you come to our offerings or something else to like find your community in this time and be resourced with other human beings. Um, that to me feels just like so, so, so core. I mean, there's so many online offerings that are out there and just please do find your people um, because the isolation is so intense. And then the other thing, you know, that I think Daniel and I both share is just this notion that um, it's, it's like also important to remember the way that we are powerful, actually, right? Um, that like, and to, you know, somehow also do this deeper internal work as we are showing up in action in all these ways, like not as a way to take away from that, but as a way to complement it, right? Because when we are more aligned and in integrity inside, we have more capacity to give to the world and more clarity of where we're needed and how to speak and all of this. So we really need that. And I'm excited because I think, you know, our offerings are this very interactive space to work out some of the psychological things. And I'll just share that part of my perspective coming from the spiritual lens is that, right, everything that's happening inside is part of the path yeah. so there's no too much anger too much sadness too much that like it's all welcome and it's all part of the process so what does it look like to actually have a community space where all of those things are welcomed um, and acknowledged and and seen and recognized and you know worked through and all of this so right and that helps us make that that all important shift yes if our intention is healing then we have to make the shift somehow from the question why is this happening to me to right. how is this happening for me? What in this is for me? Yeah. What's in it for me? This, you know, that's not English, but <laughs> what's in it for me? This, uh, <laughs> but how is this for me? Really, basically, like, yeah. 
what is this anger surfing up to me? What is this uncontainable heartbreak that's too much for my one body to process serving up to me? It might be doing something I've never wanted to do before, been afraid to do, seeking sangha, seeking community, seeking others, right? Whatever it is, it's, it's showing us, if you call it a growing edge, if you wanted to be coachy about it or, you know, but you get it. It's, there's, it's just a shift in perspective. But the question, why is this happening to me, is an unanswerable question. That's a statement, which is, I'm a victim. Woe is me. I can't handle this. And that, that's kind of a cop-out. I don't have to be responsible. If I say, how is this for me? Now I'm in an inquiry that, number one, is like, oh, that's a nice idea that this is happening for my benefit. And you don't want to impose that on anyone else who's going through actual, you know, I wouldn't expect a Palestinian in Gaza to ask this question. This is a question for each of us to ask ourselves. The other thing I would say about hope, and this is my particular take, and I'm not saying everyone has to adopt it. I'm just going to share myself, and maybe you can incorporate it. I mean, I don't think I'm actually contradicting anything Hadar just said, but I don't advocate hope. I know it's very much wanted and, and needed by people. And I think it's just one of these words that has, it's kind of vague in its meaning. You have to be careful what you mean. Because capitalism sells hope. Self-help sells hope. Hallmark cards sell hope. You know? And people use hopeful Christmas carols to, send, to sell you chocolate bars and condoms and beer. Uh, you know? Hope. Hope of the kind I mean is predicated on a different future that isn't here yet and that may never get here. And so basically what it means is onboarding the soothing belief that it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Something will get better. Well, we don't know what's going to happen. Things may, may get better two seconds from now. The world could explode two seconds from now. I think that that's based on a shaky foundation. And I think that hope ultimately of that kind, and I understand that hope in resistance and all that has different meanings. So I'm not against the word, but that sense of the word hope is hopeless. What isn't hopeless is possibility because possibility is right now. You know, when I help people get unstuck on the mental chiropractic walks, by the end of the walk, nothing is gonna change about that person's life. The only thing that's gonna change is their perspective. And because their perspective shifts, their point of their experience shifts. And inside that experience, there's more possibility, which is why they're no longer stuck. So yeah. do I have hope that, that I'll see a free Palestine in my lifetime? I'm agnostic on the question. Do I see possibility of Palestinians freely expressing themselves right now? Hell yeah, I do. Do I see the possibility of making alliances across cultural differences I never would have before? I do, because it's happening. There's always the possibility of bringing forth more of my humanity in the face of whatever. And then if I live aligned with that, I don't need to hope. Now, again, people use the word differently. I'm not going to police people using it. That's just for me. Sure. Yeah, I think that just to wrap up here um, of our time, but just to say that I think like sometimes we have this understanding, right, that in our mind, oh, I need to be, you know, happy and grounded and stable and like to lead a good life or you know and spirituality the new age spiritual discourse kind of pushes that around wellness oh you need to just but that's a really um ignorant way of understanding spirituality and why we're here geez tell them what is... tell them what you really think it <laughs> yeah as you can see i mean new age spirituality is just like a Facade you like, of, you know, old, you like old age spirituality. I do. I like, and we don't call it old. We just call it modern, actually, because we're still rooted in the ancient. <laughs> um, a little convoluted time travel joke for anyone who can keep up. Um, but uh, me, anyway, me not included. <laughs> went, went right over my... <laughs> <Okay>. Next lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'll just that like this i think that there's so much industry that's in our minds around like oh we need to get better we need to feel happy we need to be okay and actually sometimes living a very deep fulfilled life is around being in grief is about being angry is about being so intimately in touch with the present right it's not about this happy go light lucky that's lifestyle actually about presence of what is happening now and the more that we attune to the presence the more 
the possibilities of the future open up and the more that we actually shift what is possible. But we cannot actually do that unless we are really in the present. So this is why it's also so important that we really honor the wide range of emotional experiences right now all of them, right? Whether you're feeling the rage, you're feeling the numbness, you're feeling the shock, you're feeling the, all, all of it, it, we need to make space for all of it because it is part of articulating the present, which is gonna carve out the path for the future. Yeah, and you've said uh, this before, that God is in whatever's actually happening. Yeah. So, God, so, so to, to reject what's happening is to estrange ourselves from spirituality. You know, the, the spirit is, in the spirit of the moment, whether it's, you know, uh, a star exploding or a baby deer being born or some of the most horrible things human beings do to each other. God is there too in a, in a strange way. And, and the last thing I'll say, you know, the person I quote the most besides Norman Finkelstein is Stephen Jenkinson, the Canadian writer, friend of mine, teacher of mine. And he says, heartbreak is a skill. And I love that. He mm. talked about how courage, you know, the muscle of the heart is courage. Totally. Well, heartbreak is kind of the workout for that thing. How do you, how do muscles get stronger? You have to tear them. You have to, you have to push them past the point and then, then they regenerate. And he also says that in times like this, it's a mandatory skill of responsible citizenship. Yeah. That's something to chew on that we're not failing anybody by being heartbroken. We might actually be doing the work we need to do. And it's from there that real creativity yeah. comes. We probably, probably need to get more heartbroken. Right? We ought because to the heartbreak, be. Yeah. Like, what does it look like to follow the broken heart into deeper and deeper dimension? Not to be spiral in it, but actually like, whoa, what's here? Painful like leg days. Exactly, Rima. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Really, truly. Um, it was lovely to have you all thank you daniel for coming on my live um maybe we'll see some of you on thursday and yeah we'll save the recording feel welcome to comment and chat and chat and continue the conversation and you will make me a collaborator the minute this ends and you will also put the the link to the offerings in the description yes sure and i can also download the recording that you can upload to youtube if you want bingo bango bongo that's I'm not, you're I'm not, smarter than me. You're smarter than me. That's if that wasn't clear already. No, let, let you said. no I just got the time travel, you know. <laughs> it's, that, it's that spiritual advantage, no matter how brilliant I am. You'll always have a leg up on me on that one. No, no. Um, okay, well, thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time.